So Hans Ebelings is uh, our first speaker this morning. Um, he's an architectural historian, writer, and critic, and the author of several books um, about uh, sort of important figures in Dutch architecture. His book, Super, Modern Super Modernism, Architecture in the Age of Globalization, which was published in 1998, um, was really a kind of seminal text, I think, in terms of uh, looking at the kind of transformations of architecture um, at the kind of end of the millennium, really, and the the sort of influences of uh, popular culture on, on architecture, uh, on the kind of transformation of the profession and the role of the architect. Um, he's also, uh, and, and it's a book that has been, it's a, it's a tiny, it's one of these great tiny little books that um, very succinctly and evocatively uh, talks about some, some fundamental transformations and I think is kind of very interesting to go back to every decade. Um, some things have changed and some things uh, remain deeply pertinent. Um, he's also the founder and editor-in-chief of A10, which is a really remarkable publication based in Europe that is, um, am I right to say it's entirely focused on European practices but from really all across Europe. So it's, it's um, and, and I think has been rem remarkable because it um, focuses on often lesser known architects and projects. Um, there's uh, a lot of coverage of work coming out of Eastern Europe, which is very interesting, um, as well as, you know, uh, Northern Europe and uh, and the Mediterranean. Um, and he is uh, currently uh, based in Montreal. One of the, we're very lucky to have absorbed him into Canada in the last few years um, and has taught at UFT and is currently teaching a master's seminar here at Waterloo. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Loda. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, my path to practice is uh, through art history and archaeology. I like to boast that I studied archaeology, although I don't know that much about it. Um, but what I did is something which I think is available for architects as well. Um, it's working, it's working. Um, so what I do is I'm writing about architecture. Whenever people ask me, what, what, what's your job? I usually say this because I found it hard to explain what I'm actually doing. And of course, writing is something everybody learned in primary school. Uh, but I believe, just like designing, it's both a craft and a gift to do it in a proper way. You need to have a certain talent for it and you need to have a love for it. Uh, so much of my work has been writing and this is just a few fast shots of my bookshelves of the things which I wrote or contributed to. And uh, it's pretty boring to show you uh, uh, books, but this is what I'm doing. So uh, currently I'm publishing my own books as the Architecture Observer. So what I'm gonna tell you is a bit how I managed to get a career out of writing and uh, what I've been doing. Um, First, the economy of writing, because that's, I think, extremely important. There is almost everywhere the same ratio of income per word, which is close to $1 if you're lucky, and it's less than $1 if you're not as lucky as you could be. Which means, if you want to make an income out of writing, you have to write a lot. And uh, I'm not saying it uh, so that you feel sorry for me, because I love to write, but it's not easy to get a full-time income out of writing, especially not because the outlets for writing are relatively sparse, especially nowadays. You can write a lot on internet or whatever, blogging, but that won't get you any income. And if you look at most, let's say, serious architectural magazines, there are fewer and fewer, and I don't know exactly, I didn't count it, but if you see the number of editorial pages in Canadian Architect, for instance, it's maybe 30. That means there is a kind of hard competition to get into a magazine. But if you want to have an income, you should maybe write, let's say, 100,000 words per year, um, which means if you want to have a day off every now and then, something like 450 words per day which is one article in every two days. 
which means you need to have a lot of subjects and you need to know a lot of editors of magazines to get all those articles published. Or it's maybe four smaller books or one large book, but if you write one large book, you won't get this uh, income of, let's say, $50,000. Uh, uh, so getting your income is not always easy. Um, you have to produce a lot and you have to find the outlets that are willing to pay you. Despite this uh, bleak uh, perspective, people manage to make an income out of writing, just like I'm doing. And for me, writing and editing are very closely related. So I always say I'm writing about architecture, but I see myself more as somebody who's editing things. And there's also the third word, curating. I make exhibitions as well, but I don't like curating at all because it seems like it's such a empty phrase nowadays that everything is uh, curated. Even if you make uh, a kite, uh, it's curated by some famous person. Um, and for me, the other thing is that in the Netherlands, I'm Dutch, uh, the word curator wasn't f uh, often used until only a few years ago. And um, the word is mainly related to the fourth definition. Um, and the curator is the person who steps in uh, whenever a company is insolvent and bankruptcy is uh, imminent. And for me, there's this bankruptcy in the use of the word curator in other contexts than uh, just with bankruptcies. So I'm saying I'm making exhibitions, uh, which I'm still doing. Uh, I show you just a few images. I'm not very good in uh, archiving my own activities. Uh, so I found only a few pictures of uh, exhibitions I made, let's say, fairly recently in collaboration with other people. And they just look like the books I showed you. They're just images of something bigger. So editing, for me, is maybe the crucial part uh, in between this writing and making exhibitions. And for me, when it comes to editing, it's, you could say writing is describing something and then editing is framing it. And for me, the framing of things is extremely important. So what I see myself doing whenever I'm publishing, whenever I'm making exhibitions or writing, it's always, for me, about editing. Um, I think I was able to make a career being an art historian, moving into writing about architecture, and because I was extremely lucky to be in a particular place at a particular moment. Partly, my story is very deterministic. I believe that I'm the product of the economic prosperity of the Netherlands in the 1980s and 90s. So I studied in the 1980s, published my first article in 1984, and uh, got my first job in 1988, which was at the then newly founded Netherlands Architecture Institute, Architecture Museum, in scale comparable to the CCA in Montreal. So really exceptional holding, beautiful archives, beautiful collections. And I was lucky to be there when the institute started. In fact, I think I was the only person hired at that time. So it was just pure luck that I got this job. And I was able to make exhibitions for about a decade with serious budgets, with serious uh, uh, facilities. So that was extremely nice. Uh, one of the exhibitions I made when I was, I think, 26 or 27 was uh, the Dutch contribution for that year's Venice Biennale. So I was just still wearing shorts out of school and able to make this exhibition. Um, I worked for the Netherlands Architects Institute until the year 2000, and then I became independent. And you can see this was a year when the economy was still very much booming, so I felt confident enough to uh, start my own enterprise as a writer. And I think there were three elements which were uh, exceptional in my career. Uh, one was this economic prosperity. The other one was the cultural environment, which was extremely uh, beneficial for anyone working in the field of architecture. There was this whole infrastructure of cultural institutions which was founded. There was uh, money, uh, huge subsidies for activities. There was even a very uh, lavishly funded uh, subsidy for anyone writing about architecture. So all my publications, all my exhibitions were basically state-sponsored. And then the third one, so economy, culture, third one was the presence of Rem Koolhaas. I think 
being lucky enough to be part of a generation which was under this, let's say, long shadow of Remco Haas has been really, really important. There's this saying that, uh, uh, or there's this architectural historian, uh, Kupler, who wrote uh, The Shape of Time, a very beautiful book, in which he mentioned something, that if you're lucky enough to be of the same generation of Michelangelo, your career is certainly much better than when you are a generation older or younger. So being there in the Netherlands this time was, for me, really, really beneficial, just like for any Dutch architect, I would say. Because if you compare this with this, you can see it's a similar line going up. And I'm pretty sure I've benefited much from being present in this particular context. Here you can also see my career um, started writing serious pieces when I was 23. Uh, it's 94, I don't know what's there. Uh, I published Supermodernism when I, in 1998, and in 2004 I was 40. There you can see there's a kind of uh, leveling out of my uh, engram viewer uh, results. So it's only staying there. Um, publishing this supermodernism um, book, which I wrote in 1998 and which was translated in French, Italian, Spanish, English, Dutch, uh, has been very beneficial for my career as well. It's a tiny little book, as Lola said. You can read it in one hour, which is one of my principles. You should make a statement which you can read in one hour because otherwise you're boring people maybe, and uh, you get less influence. You, you can notice that writing a book, which you can read in one hour, uh, gives you more uh, reputation than writing this very, very serious study on which you worked for a long time. So I wrote this rather quickly, uh, and I think it really worked well. Um, then I started my own. When I left the Netherlands Architect Institute, people gave me a website which I never changed or used, but this is how it looked like, me showing um, this. And to show you something of this uh, uh, reputation I gained through uh, supermodernism, this is the work of a uh, writer and graphic artist, uh, Warren Ellis. And uh, I just stumbled upon this. I thought it was really fascinating that he is describing supermodernism in a very... Uh, precise way what it is. Uh, the fact that it's used in popular culture was, well, a tremendous joy for me. To go back, in 2004 I decided to start a magazine on European architecture together with graphic designer Arjan Groot, and the idea was, um, because in a way you could say that supermodernism was a fashionable book dealing with, at that time, fashionable architecture, and that was maybe the last moment when I had this interest in doing something which was fashionable. Uh, from that moment on, I tried to focus on things which were less obviously getting attention. Uh, and I had this hunch, it was only a hunch at that time, that um, Central and Eastern Europe was developing in a very interesting way after the collapse of communism, after the disappearance of the Iron Curtain. So we decided to make a magazine which is focusing on let's say, the non-famous architecture of Europe, uh, which was mainly located in the eastern half, which we called Central Europe uh, all the time. And people in Central Europe were extremely happy that we called it Central Europe instead of Eastern Europe, which always had this kind of grim association with uh, communism. And they were also happy for all the attention they received, this part of the world which was hardly covered at that time. So we were looking at how the Eastern Bloc changed into a former Eastern Bloc. And this whole process of being communist, being ex-communist, post-communist, and being something else is, I think, extremely interesting. And even today, I'm not editor of the magazine anymore since I moved to Montreal, but still today I think it's extremely interesting what's going on right there. And for me, there is a, a real importance in doing something like A10, describing developments in architecture outside what's in the limelight, and because I think it should be the ambition of any uh, architectural writer to expand the field of what's written about. And um, I know 
it's maybe a contrarian position, also a slightly complicated one, because you certainly get more uh, instant recognition if you write about something which is famous already. So Herzog and the Moron is a better, sub Frank Gehry, better subject than anybody from Central and Eastern Europe nobody ever heard of and probably have problems with pronouncing the name. Um, but I think it's much more interesting to, to, to try to escape from this loop of positive feedback which makes famous projects more famous and famous architects more famous because they're famous already. Um, I did the same with this book, which is maybe the outcome of A10, the magazine, European Architecture Since 1890, which is, uh, I can say, the, only, the first European architectural history which gives a kind of balanced attention to uh, the whole of Europe. So there are more architects from former Yugoslavia, Poland, or Russia, or the peripheries like, uh, let's say, uh, Ireland or Norway, included in this book than in any other publication about European architecture. And um, I consider it as quite an important thing for me personally, and I was rather optimistic about the results of uh, uh, the sales, but they're really disappointing. Nobody's interested in Europe anymore, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't really work, and nobody's interested in Central and Eastern Europe. So what I see now, and this is another part of the economy of publications, when I made uh, Supermodernism. The print run within one and a half year was uh, above 20,000. And I think with a book like this, I'm not even getting close to 2,000, even though it's translated in Russian as well. But um, there's a new, let's say, configuration of the market where it's really hard to get any best selling publication right now. In 2010, for several reasons, including economy, uh, we decided to uh, sell the magazine, and I stayed on for another two years as the editor, and then I moved to uh, Canada, escaping as lead partially, partly uh, the economic crisis which was hitting Europe. I started something new, which is called Architecture Observer, um, which I just uh, uh, spontaneously created after leaving the magazine, because I realized that if you're an individual, is another career tip, uh, if you're just an individual, it's really hard to stand out because you're almost invisible. So unless you're Kenneth Frampton or somebody with real big reputation, you have to have a brand. You have to stand out as somebody. So I thought it's much wiser to call myself the architecture observer, even though I wasn't sure what it was going to be. So I called it the multi-whatever platform for architectural criticism. It's a little website and containing only six pieces which disappear as soon as I put a new one on. I haven't been very active recently. And I publish books which I consider, let's say, a nice alternative for making a magazine. So what I do is something which is, in theory, rather quick, like this website, and something else which is slower than a magazine, um, this uh, publication of books. Um, And then part of my activities is like this, standing behind the microphone and talking about architecture and trying to promote things like my own magazine, uh, which is always fun and which leads also to extremely nice situations like here in Bulgaria, where there was this priest who also studied architecture. So he was a, a knowledgeable person and he was owning a bookstore with architecture books. And in the meantime, he was also uh, taking care of his uh, church. Um, so what happened to me, I think, having this uh, exceptional circumstances in the Netherlands, writing about Dutch architecture, getting some reputation, getting funding for publications, getting funding for getting translated into English, which I think is extremely important, allowed me to write this supermodernism, allowed me to make this step uh, to European architecture, and now I'm heading, of course, for the world with Architecture Observer. Um, and writing is, of course, something which is very hard to show. You have to read my books and my articles to know what I'm doing. Um, I published all over the place, 
uh, I can say, in serious architectural publications, even in some academic journals, but also in glossy magazines. Uh, I work for commercial things. I'm writing even sometimes uh, brochures for companies. I wrote a very interesting one a long time ago for a company which is uh, uh, producing uh, paint for car repair, and they were interested in architecture as well, so I wrote something for them. And I think, as a writer, you should always be confident. Your reputation shouldn't rely on the reputation of the publication of the journal. Uh, in that sense, I really believe in Saint-Exupéry, famous writer of The Little Prince, who spent time in New York, came back to France, and was running out of money. And he started to write for a newspaper, which all his friends considered to be a bad newspaper. And then he said, and it's kind of credo for me now, he said, Sentex, he said to this friend, if more people like me would write for this newspaper, it would be a bad newspaper. So always be confident in your own position. And then saying this, you have to be this confidence in yourself. And if you want to be a writer, I can tell you in advance, you have to enjoy the solitary confinement of being behind your computer without any colleagues or whatsoever. So it's really solitary work, which you have to love, which I do. And it's compensated, on the other hand, by meeting people, like here, and traveling a lot. Because I think one of the big advantages of my work, especially traveling in Europe, I think I make between 20 and 40 trips per year, aside from my commuting to work. Um, which I think is extremely, extremely interesting. Um, so anyone with a love a craft, for the craft of writing, anyone with a gift for the word, anyone who likes to be alone um, and is confident enough that you can make money uh, with this $50 cents or $1 per word, I can really recommend to become a writer. Thank you.